Welcome to our seventh episode of Tac Talk. I'm your host, Alden Morris. This is our second season, episode seven. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Today, I've got a couple different ideas of what we're going to be speaking about here, at least in the first segment. The second segment may differ. Here in the first segment, we're going to talk about Governor Jay Inslee and his presidential run for 2020. Um, there seems to be a lot of activity, so especially through social media, about plans that Jay Inslee has. Uh, apparently, right now, as of uh, January 11, 2019, he is currently in Nevada, I believe, um, doing, uh, I guess, uh, public appearances for different Democratic parties in order to start giving that initial campaign boost uh, for presidential run. So, this is the Q13 Fox. Now, mind you, we did have uh, someone just step down, one of the heads from Q13 Fox just stepped down for altering a, um, a uh, video of President Donald Trump. Um, uh, he was uh, found guilty for basically altering a video, and uh, it's just not what you do as a professional media outlet or someone who's a watchdog of government. You just you don't try to make it look bad for your agenda. You actually just report the truth. There's no truth to be reported, and obviously you move on. Um, and unfortunately, King F- or Q13 News is very liberal leaning, so uh, they are here, kind of uh, talking about presidential or the presidential run for Governor Jay Inslee. So we'll go ahead and take a listen. We're spending a lot of time campaigning. You've even seen him on television in some ads. Yeah, he has been traveling across the country on behalf of Democratic candidates in several states. Many are seeing this as a president pre- preparation for a presidential run in 2020 now mind you he is running on the climate change factor now here's the here's the irony that i hope that you see when it comes to our washington state taxpayer funded uh campaign officials um for example he's supposed to be here in washington state doing his job as governor and instead he's not doing his job he's out preparing for his next job which is potential president uh run However, he's running on the climate change factor, and when he tried to pass the climate change bill here in uh, the legislation here in Washington State this past uh, November, uh, his own party uh, didn't vote for it. So, again, here we go. So, C.R. Douglas has been tracking the governor's movements over the last few weeks and also what this election means for his future. You know, it's been pretty clear the last several months that the governor has been eyeing a presidential run. I mean, not only has he been a very harsh critic of President Trump, but as you've heard, he's been racking up a lot of miles traveling the country. Now, there is an official reason for that travel. He is head of the Democratic Governors Association, and it's his job to help all he can with fundraising and stumping for gubernatorial candidates. But that role conveniently includes a lot of national media interviews, lots of them. And listen to how he skirts the question about a 2020 presidential run. There's also been some talk about you looking at the race for president in 2020. What could tip you into the race? Well, I do think that uh, uh, we all have things we feel strongly about. Are you ruling out running for president in 2020 or not? No, that's another year, but we're, we're focused on 2018 right now. That's another year. So what do you? And so and again, that's uh, it's another year. Yet here he is in Nevada as of right now, doing uh, campaign movements for his presidential okay. Sounds run. Sounds like someone is keeping their options open. Now this is certainly a long shot. Let's be clear about that. But if Inslee does indeed have a big night tomorrow in terms of helping elect Democratic governors, and if he can pull off that victory tomorrow. With the carbon tax measure, Initiative 1631, that's... And that's what I was just talking about. The Initiative 1631 is the carbon tax measure that he's doing, doing on behalf of climate change. And uh, if you've heard any of my podcasts before, you know that our state actually only contributes about one one-thousandth of a single fraction of a single percent of climate change for the world's emissions. So we literally take... You take one percent, divide that up, fraction that up by thousands, now... Divide that up by another fraction, and boom, that's how much we contribute. And again, this is back in uh, November 7th, 2018, this pod, this uh, news report. And that climate change, 1631, did fail. His own party did not vote for it. Something he's been pushing for years. Those things are going to give him some serious momentum for a possible presidential run. So, tomorrow- And it did, still, regardless, even though his uh, initiative, 1631, 
uh, was buried and was shot down, he's still running for president for 2020. Tomorrow, well, it could be the beginning of a next big move on the part of our governor, and we will be watching. Well, it was kind of surprising to hear that he wasn't here. We were checking in to see, you know, is he going to be at the Democratic uh, announcement yeah. party tomorrow night um, over in Bellevue? And he wasn't. So where exactly is his trip taking him? Yeah, well, it's taking him all over the country. Um, and conveniently, it is taking him to places that have important presidential election prospects. Look at this. He's been in Iowa a couple times, Florida a couple times. These are all in the recent recent months, Wisconsin, Michigan. Again, these are where close gubernatorial contests are, but let's make no mistake. Those are also convenient presidential locations. I will say something about what you said. Where is he this week? He is out of the state this week and won't be back mm -hmm. until the end of the week. We asked his aides where he is. Well, he's campaigning, but also tomorrow night during the election returns, the next day he's going to be in Washington, D.C., doing, among other things, national media interviews. Ah, very interesting. And so we're just going to end that there since we're coming up on uh, five and a half minutes, five, about six minutes. Um, so, yeah, don't vote president for Jay Inslee. He's already been one of the worst governors Washington State has ever had. Um, and another idea that you might not have already known is while Jay Inslee has his eyes set on the presidential seat for 2020, running again on all things that his own party doesn't vote for, the climate change bill, Ice Initiative 1631 for carbon tax. Uh, our attorney general here in the state, Bob Ferguson, has his eyes on the governor's seat. So, uh, trading one evil for another evil, regardless of where Jay Inslee, I have, I have, I have no fears that Jay Inslee is, is going to be seen right through the rest of the country. I mean, we're having a very big red wave come through. Uh, the blue wave has diminished. Blue waves being the Democratic Party is still still being called out for a lot of their uh, discrepancies in their own uh, how they run things and what they uh, their their voting standards and their voting uh, portfolios and their their own, their own commitment. So it's it's pathetic to be honest. But uh, I don't see Jay Inslee becoming president for the United States at all after 2020. In fact, I see Donald Trump being reelected a second term. However, I do think that Jay Inslee wasting his time here as governor should be recognized because he's obviously got plans to not do his job here and he's running for, uh, he's trying to start his campaign for presidency. So uh, we're going to take a quick short break and when we get back, we got a lot more things to talk about. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. Combat Systems at BeastCombatSystems.com Protecting those who prepare 801-987-0893 For custom body armor carriers and tactical gear for military, law enforcement, contractors, corporate security, responsible citizens, and border patrol Beast Combat Systems at BeastCombatSystems.com 801-987-0893 For our second segment of our episode 7 of Tac Talk Season 2, I'm your host, Alden Morris. So I do want to point out that there's a capital event. If you're a Washingtonian, if you live here in Washington State, um, on January 18th, there will be an event at the state capitol. I myself will be trying to make it there. However, I'll have to be at, and I'll be in downtown Tacoma at the Pierce County Superior Court dealing with some things over there. Um, but that's at 9 a.m. I believe so right after that I plan to be at the Capitol which again I believe it starts around noon uh, ten, be Anywhere between 10 and noon usually you're gonna have a couple hours of set up there uh, But there is a rally for your rights speech um, Let me confirm that real quick. It's a it's a gun rights rally uh, at the state Capitol come uh, January 18th uh, I've been to quite a few of these in the past. I've ran security a couple of them. I've been a uh, speaker at a couple of them. And one thing I uh, really support is the amount of people that show up there. Now, there will be opposition that does show up. Uh, some of those Antifa guys do come in masks. And any counter-protesters are usually directed by Washington State Patrol down there to the other side of the Capitol grounds. Um, which is beneficial because if they start obviously provocating, if they're prov provocateurs, I mean, um, then it's pretty easy to distinguish who started it and who didn't start it. Uh, I'm going to read a little excerpt from the Olympian here. 
A gun rights rally next week at the Capitol campus is expected to draw 150 people, including some with guns. Rally for your rights will take place from 9 a.m. to noon, January 18th, on the north steps of the legislative building. The event is organized by the Gun Rights Coalition and is permitted by the Department of Enterprise Services. The state allows people to openly carry guns in most public areas, including on the Capitol campus. Washington State Patrol will be on the scene that day. So, again, uh, I was wrong about the times. It looks like it'll be at 9 a.m. So, uh, like I said, I've got court uh, on January 18th at 9 a.m. over at the Pierce County Superior Court. So I'll be on the second floor over there dealing with some custody shit that I've been having to deal with for some time now. Um, even though I have my girls right now, I'm having to rewrite a custody plan with their mother. So, who's very uncooperative, by the way. And moving on, uh, soon after that, if I have my girls that day which is pretty likely I will, um, or likely I won't, actually, since I have them today. I don't have to do the math on it again every other day. Anyways, um, if I don't have them, then I'll be going straight from the Pierce County Superior Court in Tacoma, Washington, over down to the Capitol in Olympia, Washington, to sh uh, obviously show face and to, uh, to uh, speak with some people there, uh, show my support, things like that. If I do have my girls, then it'll be a matter of, uh, depending on when I get out of court, going and souping up my girls, then getting them dressed and ready, then bringing them down to the Capitol in Olympia, which, again, they're two girls. They're two years and they're four years old. Getting the hair done, getting them bathed, getting them prettied up, that's going to be kind of difficult. So if I have my girls that day, it's a likely possibility I may not be able to make it. If I don't have my girls, I will most definitely be there. Um, one of the most... Uh, proudest moments I've done at the state capitol when it came to speaking on behalf of gun rights or speaking about gun rights is I've done a couple speeches at the state capitol. I spoke uh, several different times about several different topics. I've been filler, speaker, I've been all that good stuff. Uh, one of my most proudest moments was the I-594 rally uh, back in 2014. Uh, I did a 10 minute speech uh, in front of about 3,000 people down there. Uh, that basically spoke about gun overreaching gun laws uh, and uh, gun regulations. If you, here's a quick clip. Sounds good. In 1718, prior to the Revolutionary War, the first machine gun was invented, designed by James Puckle, a British. And that's just uh, that's just a quick essay. So what I'll do is I'll just read it to you real quick, uh, since the audio is so bad. Uh, I will leave the link down in the description so you can see it for yourself. Uh, 1718, prior to the Revolutionary War, the machine, the first machine gun was invented. Designed by James Puckle, a British inventor, lawyer, and writer, the Puckle gun was capable of firing nine rounds per minute via flintlock revolver. Although the weapon itself was designed to prevent enemies from boarding ships belonging to the British, it nevertheless proved the evolution of weaponry. In 1775, American patriot David Bushnell invented the turtle as a means to attach explosives to British ships while stationed in harbors just before the beginning of the Revolutionary War. The turtle was the first submersible craft with a documented record of use in combat. Designed to be used against the British Royal Navy, even George Washington provided funds and support for development and testing of the machine regardless of his doubts. With the evolution of weaponry in mind, the Founding Fathers wrote into the framework of the Constitution of the United States shall not be infringed for one specific reason. To ensure that the citizens of the United States would have the adequate tools available to them to repel any forces both foreign and and domestic. With time, however, the words shall not be in French slowly began to blur. Administration after administration perpetually reinterpreted every American citizen's natural born right to self defense by requiring permits for the evolution of weaponry. And that's, uh, if you've heard me in the last couple of shows, uh, they're repackaging your rights and selling them back to you as privileges. The infringement took off during the 1930s. When the federal government proclaimed that average citizens shall not be able to possess automatic weaponry, or in other words, the 1934 National Firearms Act. Although the claim was to prevent the gangsters of that era from possessing especially lethal weapons, it was nevertheless the first proof that criminals will not listen to the law and that such a law only restricts the law abiding. Shortly thereafter, the Gun Control Act of 1968 was passed requiring citizens to obtain licenses in order to sell in order to buy, sell, and trade interstate weaponry. This was also the beginning of procedures that tracked the serial numbers of all weapons, another decision that primarily only affected the law-abiding. Then in 1986, the Firearms Owners Protection Act was passed as a guise that every citizen's right to bear arms would be protected and restored if need be. However, 
All the bill clearly did was make it illegal for everyday citizens to own a machine gun or a weapon that fired more than one bullet at the squeeze of a trigger without proper government permission, or in other words, licensing. Then in 1993, the Brady Law passed, requiring background checks for those who want a weapon, which again affected the law abiding in their wallets. And again in 1994, with Clinton's assault weapons ban, which made magazines with more than 10 rounds illegal in specific states, as they were defined as large capacity magazines, as well as the bill focused primarily on semi-automatic weaponry. Fortunately, however, though, the bill expired in 2004. All this legislation only affected the law-abiding. All this government control only ever affected law-abiding citizens of this country. Requiring licensing in order to possess a weapon of choice for defense is an infringement on the right to bear arms. This is what we are to realize once again. As American citizens, we do not consent. As American citizens, we will not comply. It is time to realize how important the words shall not be infringed are and to realize that what an infringement is. We do this by studying our history to understand our present and our future. The Founding Fathers never intended a standing army to be so well equipped because they experienced this firsthand. They intended that every American citizen be well armed and well regulated in place of a standing army. It's a comforting thought to realize that so many hundreds of years ago, men like George Washington pondered what weapons of the future would be like. With the puckle gun and the turtle as just some of their examples, they knew that one day weapons would be capable of firing hundreds if not thousands of rounds per minute, and that explosives would be able to be delivered miles and miles away. And yet, they still wrote into the framework, shall not be infringed. It is time to take back the definition of infringements from our current administration. It is time to tell them we no longer consent, will nor comply, and that we as American citizens will possess the weaponry available to us and render all legislation against his right, null and void. So, that was a speech I did back in uh, December 14th of 2014 with Gavin Syme at the state capitol for the I-594 I Will Not Comply rally. And honestly, we had a great time. It was a great day. I got to meet a lot of very important people in the, in the field when it comes to uh, firearms rights and uh, firearms privileges. <clears throat> and uh, honestly, I consider myself a well-educated person when it comes to the topic of firearms however i do always get to learn more from these kind of events so if you're going to be in olympia january 18th i hope to see you there if i don't have my children if i'm fortunate enough to either get a babysitter or to be able to bring my children down there because i can't bring my children to court if i have them in court that day so um i should be there regardless like even if i have my children i should i do plan to be there so Again, this is the end of our show. Thanks for listening. I will be back over the weekend. I do have some guests lined up. We're just working out some scheduling errors and some scheduling kinks. Their convenient times are not my convenient times, so on and so forth. So, again, thanks for listening. You guys are the reason why I keep the show going because of all of those of you who tune in. So, thanks for listening. We will be back. Thank you for enjoying the seventh episode.